Okay, we just finished chapter 13, and um, in that chapter, uh, Mia um, was still really confused about the, the how they were going to get water. It took a lot of water because they had, to, for the machinery to work, they had to take water and they had a lot of leaks, but they just kept at it. And there was a guy there who just seemed to be really good about motivating the other people. He was in charge. So she's starting to notice this man who's in charge of it. And then um, Salva had quite an adventure. Uh, first, uh, they got kicked out of the Etang camp in Ethiopia with guns. They were shooting at them as they had to swim across the river. Crocodiles were eating people. Um, people were drowning. They said that day a lot of people died, like a thousand people trying to get out of that camp. It was really shocking. And when they were on the other side, Salva managed to organize a bunch of other boys. He remembered how it was for him when he was by himself. So he, he gathered this group of boys together and they walked together for a year and a half to get to Kenya, but they made it. And all the time he was telling himself, remember uncle, what uncle told you one day at a time. It's really hard to believe that those boys did that, but this is a true story and that really happened. It's kind of amazing when you really think about it, how they did that. Okay, chapter 14. Southern Sudan, 2009. For three days, the air around Mia's home was filled with the sound of the drill. On the third afternoon, Mia joined the other children gathered around the drill site. The grown-ups rose from their work pounding rocks and drifted over too. The workers seemed excited. They were moving quickly as their leader called out orders. Then, whoosh! A spray of water shot high into the air. This wasn't the water that the workers had been piping into the borehole. This was new water, water that was coming out of a hole. Everyone cheered at the sight of the water. They all laughed at the sight of the two workers who had been operating the drill. They were drenched, their clothes completely soaked through. A woman in the crowd began singing a song of celebration. Nia clapped her hands along with all the other children. But as Mia watched the water spraying out of the borehole, she frowned. The water wasn't clear. It was brown and heavy looking. It was full of mud. Okay. Ifu Refugee Camp, Kenya, 1992 to 96. So that's four years. Salva was now 22 years old. 22. For the past Five years he had been living in refugee camps in northern Kenya. First at Kakuma camp, then at Ifo. Kakuma had been a dreadful place, isolated in the middle of a dry, windy desert. Tall fences of barbed wire enclosed the camp. You weren't allowed to leave unless you were leaving for good. It felt almost like a prison. 70,000 people lived at Kakuma. Some said it was more, 80 or 90,000. There were families who had managed to escape together, but again, as in Ethiopia, most of the refugees were orphan boys and young men. The local people who lived in that area did not like having a refugee camp nearby. They would often sneak in and steal from the refugees. Sometimes fights broke out and people were hurt or killed. After two years of misery at Kakuma, Salva decided to leave that camp. He had heard of another refugee camp far to the south and east where he hoped things would be better. Once again, Salva and a few other young men walked for months, but when they reached the camp at Ifu, they found that things were no different than at Kakuma. Everyone was always hungry and there was never enough food. Many were sick or had gotten injured during their long, terrible journeys to reach the camp. A few medical volunteers could not care for everyone who needed help. Salva felt fortunate that at least he was in good health. He wanted desperately to work, to make a little money that he could use to buy extra food. He even dreamed of saving some money so that one day he could leave the camp and continue his education somehow. But there was no work. There was nothing to do but wait. Wait for the next meal, for news of the world outside the camp. The days were long and empty. They stretched into weeks, then months, then years. It was hard to keep hope alive when there was so little to feed it. 
Some of you might be feeling that way right now, locked in your house. It's like, when will this ever end? You may be wondering, will it ever end? And I'm here to tell you that actually, yes, it will. And things will go back to normal. And we'll learn from this experience, just like Sal is learning from his. Michael was an aid worker from a country called Ireland. Salva had met a lot of aid workers. They came and went, staying at the camp for several weeks, or at most a few months. The aid workers came from many different countries, but they usually spoke English to each other. Few of the refugees spoke English, so communication with the aid workers was often difficult. But after so many years in the camps, Salva could understand a little English. He even tried to speak it once in a while and Michael almost always seemed to understand what Salva was trying to say. One day after the morning meal, Michael spoke to Salva. You seem interested in learning English, he said. How'd you like to learn to read? The lessons began that very day. Michael wrote down three letters on a small scrap of paper. A, B, C, he said, handing the scrap to Salva. A, B, C, Salva repeated. The whole rest of the day, Salva went around saying, A, B, C, mostly to himself, but sometimes aloud in a quiet voice. He looked at the paper a hundred times and practiced drawing the letters in the dirt with the stick over and over again. Salva remembered learning to read Arabic when he was young. The Arabic alphabet had 28 letters, the English only 26. In English, the letters stayed separate from each other so it's easy to tell them apart. In Arabic words, the letters were always joined and a letter might look different depending on what came before or after it. Sure, you're doing lovely, Michael said the day Salva learned to write his own name. You learn fast because you work so hard. Salva did not say what he was thinking, that he was working hard because he wanted to learn to read English before Michael left the camp. Salva did not know if any of the other aid workers would take the time to teach him. But once in a while, it's good to take a break from work. Let's do a wee bit different for a change. I'm thinking you'll be good at this. You're a tall lad. So Salva learned two things from Michael, how to read and how to play volleyball. A rumor was spreading around the camp. It began as a whisper, but soon Salva felt as if it were a roar in his ears. He could think of nothing else. America, the United States, the rumor was that about 3,000 boys and young men from the refugee camps would be chosen to go live in America. Salva could not believe it. How could it be true? How would they get there? Where would they live? Surely it was impossible. But as the days went by, the aid workers confirmed the news. It was all anyone could talk about. They only want healthy people. If you are sick, you won't be chosen. They won't take you if you've ever been a soldier with the rebels. Only orphans are being chosen. If you have any family left, you have to stay here. Weeks passed, then months. One day a notice was posted at the camp's administration tent. It was a list of names. If your name was on the list, it meant that you had made it to the next step, the interview. After the interview, you might go to America. <clears throat> Salva's name was not on the list nor was it on the next list or the one after that. Many of the boys being chosen were younger than Salva. Perhaps America doesn't want anyone too old, he thought. Each time a list was posted, Salva's heart would pound as he read the names. He tried not to lose hope. At the same time, he tried not to hope too much. Sometimes he felt he was being torn in two by the hoping and the not hoping. One windy afternoon, Michael rushed over to Salva's tent. Salva, come quickly. Your name is on the list today. Salva leapt to his feet and was running even before his friend had finished speaking. When he drew near the administration tent, he slowed down and tried to catch his breath. He might be wrong. It might be another person named Salva. I won't look too soon. From far away, I might see a name that looks like mine and I need to be sure. Salva shouldered his way through the crowd until he was standing in front of the list. He raised his head slowly and began reading through the names. There it was. Salva Dute, Rochester, New York. Salva was going to New York. He was going to America. End of chapter 1.
end of chapter 14.